Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 30th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and also on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the coming fiscal tsunami facing state and local governments and why HB 331, the Alaska Oil Credit Bonding Bill, is part of the problem. Second, we discuss the question of whether the Alaska economy is getting better or just worse at a slower rate. And third, our thoughts on the critical issues three weeks out from the Alaska primary. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. That's right, Brad Keithley is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. It's an organization dedicated to getting Alaska back on track fiscally, and every week he comes in to talk about his top three. Top three. What are his top three? Well, here they are right here. He's going to tell us all about it. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? You know, I'm back home. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm trying to get my life back in order here, and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're moving right along, moving right along, my friend. Well, it sounds like you're on a roll this morning. I, I, I'm late calling in because I was listening, and, and, and you were just you were humming through it. <laughs> just moving right on through. That's what we do. Well, let's get started. I mean, I I got to be honest with you. This first the first piece, the number one on your uh, on your uh, top three weekly top three has been something that I've been concerned about for quite a while. Obviously, we here in Alaska have a toe in this in this pond. This is a big deal. Um, but it's talking about the pensions, not just the, the the PERS and TERS, not just the unfunded liability in the state of Alaska. This is a huge problem for the entire country right now, and it's got about it's going to come back and bite us. It is. So the Wall Street Journal has been running a series on retirement as the baby boomers have moved through the have moved through their life cycle now and are, and are entering retirement. This huge wave of of um, of, of citizens. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has started uh, delving into the issues related to retirement. Some of them are about personal retirement. This particular article that uh, that I posted as the top three, one of the top three uh, this week, is about the impact on state and local governments of the of the baby boomers hitting uh, retirement age, and it's huge. I the I was sort of staggered by the by the by the description. Uh, or the headline on the article. The headline on the article is the pension hole for the pension hole. Now this is this is the unfunded pension portion portion. The unfunded portion. The pension hole for U.S. cities and states is the size of Japan's economy. <laughs> now Japan is the third is the third largest economy in the world. It has a GDP of about five trillion dollars uh, annually. And, and the size of the whole, the size of the unfunded liability, and this is just at the state and city level, the state and local level, the size of the unfunded whole is, is at $5 trillion, the size of Japan's economy. That's, you know, that's a fairly staggering analogy um, uh, that they start out with. And then they go through a series of stories about various states and localities uh, that are being hit by it. They don't get to Alaska. They very easily could have. I mean, we've got a a, 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 a dog in this hunt, uh, as well as other states and localities. Uh, we've got a, we are we've got about an eight trillion or an eight billion dollar uh, hole in our uh, pension funding. 
uh, that uh, that we're going to have to close uh, over the over you know the next several years, uh, and that's a that's a big chunk of state spending of where state spending is going to go, paying off um, uh, the unfunded portion of the liability. So this is an this is an article that resonated with me both at both at from a general fiscal policy perspective as well as from a state fiscal policy perspective. Absolutely. And we're seeing this over and over and over again across the country. Uh, cities that have gone bankrupt, uh, cities that have gone into re- you know receivership or had to reorganize completely because of the, po- the promises of politicians in days of plenty um, and, and, and where it's led us to now. I mean, now initially... This all seemed to make sense because when this first got started, what was happening was when they were trying to attract uh, workers into government, good, solid employees, one of the ways to attract it because the salary in government at that time was lower than the average private sector job. And so they had to attract them with the benefits, whether it was the health care or this kind of gold plated pension and retirement. And uh, and I guess that was fine at the time because the wages were so low. But now, of course, that's reversed. I mean, state and local and federal uh, employees, on average, make more than their private sector counterparts, unless you get into some very specialized areas. But the average worker, generally speaking, makes more in wages, and now they make more in wages, and they make more in their benefits on top of it. And with all these promises that were made in times of plenty, when it gets tough, now they've got whoever's left, whatever politicians are left over now from years past, now have to deal with the aftermath. And in some cases, these cities just can't hack it. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a tough situation, and, and and it's not just it's not just the state and local situation. This article focuses on it, and and we need to focus on it at a state level in Alaska as well as a local level in Alaska. But it's a it's a national problem because Social Security is the same problem. Social Security and Medicare is facing the same problem. The trust fund uh, for uh, Medicare runs out in the 2020s. The trust fund for Social Security runs out uh, in the early 2030s. Uh, And we're looking at some significant issues uh, related to either cutting benefits. uh, The the current uh, uh, projection on Social Security is we have to cut benefits by a quarter, 25 percent, to to it when once the trust fund runs out in the early 2030s. Uh, we're looking at, sign- at a significant at, at this being a significant issue, also from a national level. But it's just I, I, the, the the focus on the state uh, and the city level is huge. The, the the other aspect of this, Michael, is what do you do about it? I mean, the the, the solution. And frankly, you're start. I'm starting to see as I listen to various uh, read various uh, uh, policy uh, fiscal policy pieces around the country listen to various fiscal policy podcasts and, and videos, I'm starting to see a generation uh, issue here. Uh, it's, the, it's the current generation, the, the baby boomers that are entering into retirement uh, and, and looking to uh, uh, exercise their pensions and, and start relying on their pensions. But frankly, it's the younger generation that's gonna have to pay for it. Right. Uh, the, the, the way we're gonna deal with social security if we're going to deal with it, if we're not going to cut benefits back, uh, the way you're going to deal with Social Security and Medicare uh, is by raising taxes uh, on 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 still working uh, uh, those still in the workforce, and that's uh, that's the younger generation. I mean, that's that that increasingly is going to be the millennials uh, and others uh, uh, who are younger who are going to be paying those, and they're going to see a situation in which they're paying increased taxes essentially to fund pensions uh, for an older generation. And they're increasingly going to take the view, as I, as I hear on, on one podcast, a uh, fiscal policy podcast, they're going to increasingly take the view that, uh, hey, you guys should have been saving for this. Right. You guys should have been putting away the money when you were working. You shouldn't have lived the good life, uh, had, you know, had, had, had more income, not, put a, not, not paid as much in taxes, had more income, had more government services, when you were working, you shouldn't have lived that good a life uh, and, and put away money for, you know, save uh, for this day when the baby, baby boomers hit uh, retirement. Um, and basically, they're going to take the position, look, we, we don't owe you this. It was your fault for putting yourselves in this situation. We don't owe you this. We're going uh, to cut back on benefits or we're going to do other things that 
that that limit the amount of contributions we're going to make to sort of make you whole uh, for on, on your pensions. And that, you know, it's not it's not picking up much steam now because baby boomers still are a big part of the vote. Uh, but as as things shift uh, and the younger generation becomes a larger and larger part of not only the voting population, but also the political force, the political governance in the country, uh, the expectation is that that issue becomes more and more of a generation issue. So right. th- this is an issue that's, that's going to stay with us for a for a fairly long period of time. And it's going to have different dimensions as we move through time. Well, yeah, and I and I would like to point out that when it does start to happen, it's going to accelerate quickly. Simon Black had an article out here about five or six days ago that talked about uh, that 1,400 corporate pension plans. You, we've been talking about state and federal and local government uh, with Moody's putting it close to $7 trillion in short funding. Uh, but he also mentions the 1,400 corporate pension plans that are $553 billion short. And according to Boston College, 25% of those will go broke in the next decade. So think about that. A full quarter of U.S. non-government employees expecting to receive their pension to fund their retirement will probably get zero. So when the wheels come off the bus on this thing, it's going to get ugly fast. It is. And and the, so I've seen some statistics, some studies that have shown that more than 50% of retirees uh, for example, are, ret- are are depending upon Social Security, full social, what they believe to be full Social Security, for a significant portion of of their retirement. Now, it's it's higher. It's a higher percentage than that. They're relying on Social Security for more than 50% of their retirement income. Right. Uh, was the number, and, and the and the percentage relying on it is a is a significantly higher percentage. Uh, that's you know, <laughs> so when you talk about Social Security cutting a quarter of Social Security benefits more. A large chunk of the retirement population is going to be relying for Social Security on more than for more than 50 percent of their income. You start talking about cutting a quarter of that of that benefit. You're going to have you're going to have huge problems. And then you layer on top of that the the impact of the private uh, retirement that you're talking, the, the issues related to private retirement, which you're talking about and the issues related to state and local government uh, retirement. It is going to be a serious problem now. The journal article says there's three ways to, to deal with this, and, and you know these are basically common sense uh, steps. Cities and states can either raise taxes, cut services, or become more aggressive about reducing benefits to retirees. The cut services is cut other state services uh, in order to shift more money over to uh, paying retirement, essentially crowding out uh, other uses of state of state revenues to in order to uh, shift a, a lot more over to to make sure the retirement benefits uh, remain whole. So it's either raise taxes, raise revenues, cut ser- cut other government services, or become more aggressive about reducing benefits to retirees. We're going to face that in Alaska. We've got a constitutional provision uh, that says that uh, uh, contracts, public contract, pu- public uh, retirement contracts. Are to be treated as sacrosanct and 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 funded uh, as a matter of the Constitution. So that's going to be an issue in Alaska. So if we can't cut benefits, if that's not if that's something that doesn't happen, then we're either going to have to raise taxes or crowd out other government services. As the generational split becomes more pronounced, uh, you know, it's not beyond it's not beyond the pos- the realm of possibility that the constitutions can be amended. Right. Uh, and 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 one could envision. Uh, at some point in this process, the con- people looking at the Constitution to amend it uh, to reduce benefits that way. So it, it's an issue that that is going to be with us uh, for a long, uh, a long period yet to come. I mean, one of the problems, <laughs> one, of, one of the problems, I, I, I need to be careful about using that term. But from a fiscal perspective, one of the problems that is that is confronting these these pension funds is that people are living longer right uh and so you're going to have you're going to have the issue of of not only uh, uh not only as the it's not only going to hit as you start into these as as the baby boomers hit retirement age but it's because it's, but it's going to it's going to drag on longer or continue longer uh because people are living longer and people are going to be trying right. to draw from these pensions longer 
Well, there's actually two components to that. Not only are they living longer, but the cost of health care has risen exponentially. And so those two factors combined are really, that's really the, de- the death blow to a lot of these pension funds, is that not only are they living longer, but it's costing more to live longer through their, you know, their health care and everything else. And, and, Brad, there's a component of this that I think we need to address that, I mean, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, not the fact that the, 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 the uh, ARM board, has not been receiving their annual required contributions from the state on many years where the state just decides we need that money somewhere else. And so they won't fully fund the contribution requirement. Um, and we've seen that go on and on. Uh, you know, I think in 10 years, they, they actually hit the arc twice in 10 years um, and, and, and underfunded it the, the rest of the eight years. And that's a problem. But here's the thing. This is a ball that once it gets too far out in front of you, you can't get it fixed. There was another article talking about Philadelphia. Philadelphia in 2000 had funding at about 77% of what it was required. By 2017, it had dropped to less than 50 cent, 50% of, of their you know liability. But in the interim, between 2001 and 2017, they had actually increased their funding to the fund by 230%, and they still went backwards. The ball had gotten too far away from them, and that's what I'm afraid of. We're going to keep kicking this can, kicking this can. All of a sudden, we're not going to be able to reach the can anymore, and it will eat us alive. Yeah, and, and part of the part of the reason for that, Michael, is is the returns – that that these pension funds are assuming they're going to get on their investment because they, they have, I mean, there's been a bunch of money contributed. It's over an investment fund. Part of the revenue they're counting on in the future is the earnings from the investments they're making off of the investment fund that they have. A big part of the problem is that these pension funds have been counting, counting on an average 8% return year in, year in, year in, year out uh, all along and are in fact anticipating uh, continuing to count on 8% returns uh, uh, going forward. That's part of their plan. So the con- the annual contributions that have been set in Alaska, for example, are premised on this investment fund producing 8% returns and, and taking up a portion of the burden through those 8, 8% returns. Well, you may get 8, 8% returns, you may get 10% returns some years, but you're not. But none of the pension funds have been doing that consistently. And generally speaking, government has now been lowering uh, the the anticipated returns from eight percent down to seven percent. Down some go as low as six percent now to try to be try to be conservative. And as you lower those anticipated returns, as you say, the hole gets bigger and bigger because you're not you're not now you're no longer anticipating or counting on or projecting that you're going to get revenues from the investment fund that are going to help you close the hole. As you bring that number down, the the hole gets bigger and the required contribution that's going to be required from from taxpayers or from somebody to close that hole gets bigger. Uh, That's part of the problem. That's part of the problem that we faced that we faced in Alaska. We anticipated big returns. They didn't occur. We created a hole. Um, we, we, you know, we threw $3 billion into that hole in 2014, uh, if, if memory serves to try to try to close that gap back. We then anticipated eight return, 8% returns on, on the investment fund that now was $3 billion richer. That hasn't occurred. So now the hole's opening again. Um, and, and that, you know, the longer that goes on, the longer you count on those higher returns that don't, uh, that don't materialize. The bigger the hole gets, and the more that that, that future uh, taxpayers, future uh, uh, legislatures are going to have to appropriate to it. This is one of the reasons, frankly. I mean, people, some people are complaining that I'm talking about it too much, but this is one of the reasons that I have gone on this on this on this theme of kicking costs down the road. That that we that we're going to get ourselves as a state in bigger and bigger trouble the more we kick costs down the road. It's, it's one of the core issues, one of the core problems I have with HB 331, which is the oil tax credit bill, which proposes to go out and issue a bunch of bonds in order to pay off the, the, the remaining oil tax credits and then push the payments for those bonds down into the 2020s and 2030s. Kick, in essence, kick the current costs that we're facing on oil tax credits into the next decade and part of the decade beyond that. Well, the problem with that is we've got these pension obligations that are right. that are going to sh- start showing up big time 
in that same time frame. We need to get as, done with as many costs uh, as we can uh, before we hit this before we hit this huge bump in the road that's coming up, uh, or else you know, or else we're we're, we're going to have to you know cut future services or increase future taxes even more, not only to deal with pension costs but also to deal with costs like HB 331 that are being kicked uh, into the next decade. So it's a this to me. If, if somebody said, tell me your top issue, fiscal policy issue, your top fiscal policy concern, uh, uh, looking forward into the next decade and the decades beyond that, this is it, that we kick these costs down the road uh, and, and they're going to hit our doorstep in a huge way uh, in the 2020s and 2030s, burdening our children and our grandchildren with costs that we refuse to take on ourselves. Uh, and leaving them holding the bag, and and the boomerang on that, uh, I think that we've got to that we've got to be cognizant of is they're going to say, oh no, you don't. You should have saved for this yourself. And right. the fact you didn't, we're we're not we're not. You, you can't look to us to to you know burden our lives to have a worse life than you had than you created for yourselves by kicking all these costs down. You can't look to us, so we're not paying them. And and then we've got a generation of seniors that no longer have uh, have the, the type of pension support that they thought they were going to have. Well, and I think this is the problem with the politicization of this process, because that's, I mean, this literally becomes a very political process, and you have a lot of these pension boards and funds for these municipalities and states where they don't want to give you the hard truth. I mean, you're talking about the projected 8% returns, and I mean, just as a hard example, Cal TERS and PERS, which is the California TERS and PERS program, um, has had that eight percent for years, and yet over the last ten years, Calpers has returned like five point one percent continuously. I mean, you, somebody's got to say, "Look, these projections just aren't aren't realistic." But if they did that, then somebody would have to take the heat for it. So nobody does. So they want to dodge the bullet. So they do, and the hole just gets bigger and bigger. And as you said, puts that burden on our future. And what happens? What what paint me the picture, Brad? What happens when this younger millennial generation says, "Whoa, that's not my problem. That's your problem, Jack, because you didn't save." Well, I I think at that point, I mean, we go back to the three the three solutions that the journal was talking about. Uh, one is to raise taxes. Second is to cut government services, or the third is become more aggressive about reducing benefits to retirees. And frankly, uh, I think in some locations. Uh, that are going to be millennial heavy um, and, 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 and realizing the burden that got shifted to them, I think we're going to see cutbacks, significant cutbacks in payments to retirees. The, the retirees are going to complain. They're going to say, look, you know, we, we worked. You know, we're no longer in, a, in, a, in, in the working portion of our lives. We worked for this um, and, and we're entitled to it. And the millennials are going to say, I think rightfully so. Look, guys. You should have saved while you were working. You made all this money. Um, you should have put aside more. Um, you should have been more realistic in your estimates of, of what the returns were going to be. You wanted to live the good life. Um, and so you, you didn't tax yourself enough. Uh, you didn't cut government, other government services so you can continue, continue to have a great life um, as opposed to putting more money uh, into these investment accounts. Um, and so it's your, you did it to yourselves. You can't blame us. You guys did it to yourselves. And the retirees are going to turn around and sort of say, you know, we got, we got left, we got, we got, you know, left, left aside by our politicians at the time. But, you know, you really have, you, the retirees are really going to have, have no one to blame but themselves because they let the politicians get away with this. Right. It's not like people weren't saying, hey, We've got a we've got a coming problem with these with these pension issues. We can't afford what we're promising to give. We're not we're not setting aside enough. We're trying to you know keep too much money going to you know construction contracts or whatever the heck government was spending on spending money on at the time. Um, and the retirees are going to have a hard time have a hard time defending against that. So it's right. a it, 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 there's there's going to be a confrontation. Uh, in some in some locations, Alaska may be one of them. Uh, between between the retirees who say, "Pay us now," you know, continue continue to pay us what we think we're entitled to, and the millennials who say, "You did this to yourselves. Too bad." 
Yeah, no, and I'm with you on that. And and again, this is really not even touching, although it, it's it's tangentially connected to the Social Security issue. I mean, th- th- this is really the perfect elements of the perfect storm all kind of coming together. If we don't get a grip on this now, and I just don't think, quite honestly, Brad, we could talk about this till we're blue in the face. I've been talking about this for years. I'm sure you have as well. Um, I mean, it will. There, there's just no political will to fix this at this point because, as I said earlier, the politicization of the of the funds. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to be the guy that has to deliver to the pensioners, to the potential, you know, to the near retirees and to the employees and and the public that hey, this thing is screwed and we need to do something or else. Nobody wants to be that guy. So I think, unfortunately, unless something changes. It has to come unstuck before somebody does something about it, and by then it's too late. Yeah, well, that's it's going to be it's going to be a bad situation because you're going to have retirees in their seventies at that point uh, who are you know who who again going back to these statistics that a significant portion of them are requiring or relying on things like Social Security for more than fifty percent of their income. You're going to have retirees at that point. You're going to feel like they're you know they've been they they're stuck. They can't do anything about it. Uh, and millennials who are going to be saying it's your you did it to yourselves, right. uh, and we're just going to be we're just going to be in a horrible situation. What we yes, people don't want to talk about it. You and I can talk about it till we're blue in the face. One thing we can do is not make it worse. Right, and Absolutely. things like HB and, and things like HB three thirty one, it's that's much more than an oil issue. And 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 I'll let me just take a moment in a second to describe why it's much more than an oil issue. But things like HB 331 make it worse because we're kicking current costs, costs that current Alaskans ought to be ought to be dealing with, just like we current Alaskans ought to be dealing better with their with the retirement costs that are that are, that are out there. Uh, uh, we're dealing with car- current costs that Alaskans ought to be ought to, Alaskans ought to be dealing with, and we're kicking it down the road and making the road worse. One one sort of side note on why HB 331 is more than just oil. What HB 331 does so for the first time is take annual costs, costs that the state otherwise would be paying annually, bundle them up, pay them off all at one time, and, and then kick, kick the payments that otherwise should be made currently down the road. There's not a, if this gets through the Supreme Court, there's not a huge distinction between what we're doing with these oil credit costs and, and K-12 through costs or Medicaid right. costs. right. Uh, in, in any given year, you could you could say, well, you know, we're going to create this separate corporation like they've done in HB 331. Uh, we're going to we're going to say the state's going to pay the separate the separate corporation over time. The separate corporation is going to go out and bond for these costs. You can call it the K through 12, you know, trust fund, or you can call it the Medicaid trust fund, and start kicking other annual costs uh, down the road. So y- yes, uh, dealing with pensions is is a huge problem. Um, and, and, you know, maybe we make a little bit of leeway in, or a little bit of progress. Any progress we make is going to be a good thing. But we can stop making it worse by doing things like HB 331 and kicking other costs down the road and sort of saying, look, you've got to stop this, you know, the current generation. You've got to pay for at least a portion of, of, of the mess you've created and not keep kicking it down the road to future generations. Brad Keithley is our guest. He's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, organization dedicated to bringing Alaska back on track fiscally for the future. Uh, we've been talking about the uh, unfunded liability issue across the entire United States and specifically Alaska and what we can do about it. But this kind of leads us on to our second one. We kind of stuck on that one because I find it so fascinating, Brad. The second one actually kind of ties back into that because we're still having we still have a problem. The, the economy is still slow, although some are saying, well, you know, the, the slowdown is slowing down. So that might be a good thing. What, what's going on with that? Well, I think I think those who would say the slowdown is slowing down is is are, are have much the better argument some people you know want to write a, a headline that says recession over or recession over in 2019 right alaskas are out of alaskans are out of the recession well what's really going on is the recession we're we're, we're, we're not digging our way into the hole as deeply as fast as we were uh from from 2015 on but we're still digging into the hole the hole has, we haven't plateaued out the hole, and we certainly aren't coming up uh, the other side of the hole yet. We're just digging the hole at a less at a less rapid rate, at a less rapid rate. 
there was an article in uh, uh, the Juno Empire last week, one of James Brooks's articles, uh, that, that headlined, Job Losses Appear to Be Slowing Across the State. Good news, the hole's not getting deeper as fast, but the hole's still getting deeper. There are still job losses across right. the state. Right. Um, and, and I'm not sure we worked through that. One of the reasons, it worked entirely through that, one of the reasons that job losses have not been any more severe is that local government uh, actually has added jobs uh, uh, over over the course of this recession. State government has gone down a little bit, but local government has actually added jobs at school districts and, and other forms of local government. I'm not sure how long that can go on. Um, it's sort of like they're a lagging indicator. Local government's been a lagging indicator uh, of, of, of the recession uh, but unless, you know, unless the local tax base starts stepping up and, and paying more to support local government or state government uh, starts diverting even more money to local government, I'm not sure how local government continues uh, to sustain that. So I don't think we've seen the end of the job losses. And, you know, people say, well, oil, oil, uh, oil work is going to come back up. Oil jobs are going to come back up. They're going to come back up some but there was an article, there's been a lot of discussion in the oil industry uh, recently about the fact that we're not going to replace all those jobs that were there before we hit 2014. Technology in the drive to reduce costs that the oil industry has been on since, uh, since the oil price drop in 2014, in their drive to reduce costs to be able to, to produce margins or have margins at much lower oil prices, um, tech, they've used technology to, to, to replace uh, a bunch of jobs. And so there's, there's been a long series of articles about, or a long series of analysis about the fact that we're not going to come back up to the level of oil industry jobs uh, that we had uh, before upstream oil industry exploration and production jobs that we had uh, before we went into, uh, before we went into the cost slide. So yes, I, activity, the Conoco activity uh, on the western part of the North Slope, uh, the oil search activity around its pros oil search and Repsol and, and Armstrong around around their prospect uh, and other similar prospects are gonna are gonna result in job increases, but they're not gonna come back up to the same level. So we've come down, we've dug this hole in terms of in, term, in terms of job losses. The hole is is not getting deeper at as rapid a rate, but it's still getting deeper. And I'm not sure that that even when we plateau. The, and start adding jobs back on the oil side that, that we're going to come back up anywhere near uh, the level we, we were before we went down. So it's, I, it's good news in the sense that it's sort of like hitting your head against a wall, right? Uh, you're not hitting your head as, 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 as frequently against the wall, but you're still hitting your head against the wall. And, and it's not like you're going to get back to where you're not hitting your head at all. Uh, we're going to have some long-term uh, uh, loss as a result of, uh, of what we've been through. Harold says, Brad keeps forgetting about economic growth. Sure, the costs are being pushed into the future, but the percentage of debt should drop in relation to the size of the economy. I think that that might be a little um, ambitious. I think that might be a little optimistic because uh, all I see is right now is the debt continues to grow. What do you say? Oh no, the, the the debt as a I mean at the federal level, for example, and also at the state level, at the federal level, debt is, as a percent of GDP is growing. Um, right now, debt as a percent of GDP debt uh, at the federal level, public debt held by the public, federal debt held by the public as a percent of GDP is somewhere in the seventy five percent to eighty percent range. Every economic projection out there, including uh, by the Trump administration uh, shows that debt as a percent of GDP continuing to grow uh, over the next 10 year period. So yeah, there may be, there will be some economic growth. Uh, uh, we can debate how much economic growth there can be, but debt is gaining uh, at a rate uh, significantly greater than, uh, than the rate of economic growth. I, you know, I see this and I see the job loss is dropping, but I start to wonder you know, is that just the paring back of the low hanging fruit? And there's really not a lot left for the basic economy. And it's not something to to uh, it's not something to to uh, celebrate because 
you know, there's just no more kind of the extraneous or extras. Now we're going to be cutting into this, maybe this 1,700 jobs versus the five or 6,000 jobs are now going to be, you know, those are the, those are the deeper, more long-term, higher paid. You know, that's the stuff that we, we cut the fat first, you know, or the, or the stuff that was easier to cut. Now we're cutting down into the bone. Yeah, there's some of that. I mean, a, 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 a significant part of the job losses that occurred quickly uh, in our current recession were oil industry jobs, which tend to be the higher paying jobs um, uh, in Alaska. We, we've sort of we've, we've sort of been through a lot of those. Uh, and those once we plateau, once we hit the bottom and sort of start working back up, those should be some of the ones we add. So I, I'm not sure that um, that we that I'm not sure what, how to describe whether we've cut into the bone or not, uh, but I do think that we're going to come back with some higher uh, as we come out of this. Whenever we come out of it, uh, we're going to come back with some higher paying jobs. The ones the ones that we're still continuing to lose probably uh, are middle income jobs. We've probably lost all of the oil industry jobs, the higher paying jobs. Uh, that I think we're going to lose. So we're probably losing middle and lower income uh, jobs as we go deeper into this. I know that one of the, the big areas that have been hurt that, that, you, that, that we've seen show up recently uh, is retail, uh, jobs in retail, and jobs in retail tend to be uh, lower paying jobs. So I, I, don't, I don't think, Michael, that we've, got, that we've got more to go in terms of high paying jobs, but, you know, I you look at local government, maybe, you know, maybe some of those jobs that we've got yet to go are going to be, well, are going to be higher paying jobs. Yeah. And I think Karen actually asked a good question too. She says, and how exactly are people supposed to save when the government keeps taking more and more? That's really the problem. You know, you've got all these people who are on private pensions or these other things and they're starting to have to script more and more. I mean, that money that I, you know, any money I would have received for the permanent fund would have gone right into my retirement now because uh, because I've, I've, I'm living in a lower cost of living situation. But, I mean, that's a that's a prime point. How are we supposed to save when the government keeps uh, keeps consuming more and more of the pie? Well, you, you, <laughs> our standard of living, our standard of living has basically, when you look over the span of time, the standard of living over the last 20, 25 years has been artificially high. It's been buoyed by particularly over the last decade, has been buoyed by excess government spending it, it, with, without you know, taking taxes to, to pay for it. Uh, it's been buoyed by not setting itself aside enough for pensions and retirements. So frankly, looking at it over that span of time, we've lived a higher life, higher, uh, higher uh, uh, expensive life or a higher spending life. Uh, then frankly, uh, then frankly, we should when you when you when you sort of, you know, mix all these time periods together. Um, and so, yeah, uh, government's going to be taking more of it. Uh, we're just going to have to learn to live, frankly, with with less. It's right. uh, it, it's not a it's not a good situation. It's not the situation you want to be in. It's particularly not the situation you want to leave your kids in. But that's what we've done. Right. So. I mean, to, to, to say we can continue to live the high life, government shouldn't take more to, to deal with the costs that have been created in the past uh, is sort of unrealistic. Well, and, 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 and the worst part would be to leave our kids with an even bigger mess of having them pay for it, quite honestly. I mean, that's really the, the worst part. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You can find him on Facebook. We've got a link at the top of our Facebook broadcast there to his Facebook page. That's the best place to get all the info. Let's move on to your third topic for the day, Brad, which, of course, is, okay, great, what do we do about all this? Because, I mean, that's really – we come down to this, and you and I beat the hell out of these topics – and uh, get down way down into the dirt with it, and I, and I love that. But then people come away with, "Oh my God, I'm exhausted. What do I do now?" And I think, <laughs> and I think that's kind of where I think that's kind of where you're at right now. I mean, what do I do? I mean, what can I do? How can I fix this? Because this thing is so broken and out of kilter. How can we fix it? And that actually leads us to number three. Number th yeah, and number three is we're three weeks out from the primary. Uh, what's it looking like? What should it look like? What, what you know, do, do I think uh, uh, particularly for this segment uh, about, about where we're headed in the primary? Um, and the answer is we need to be looking for we, all the candidates are out on the field. Uh, we're not going to have any more candidates come in. 
certainly. Everybody's now focusing on their end game. All the candidates are now focusing on their end game, their their final pitches, their you know putting their best foot forward, uh, uh, talking about issues, frankly, that voters want them to talk about. This is one of the few times you get politicians actually to deal with the issues you want because they're looking for your vote. Um, and so these last three three weeks, what are we looking for? And I personally am looking for candidates who have a huge sense of fiscal responsibility, not just not just the passing. Oh yeah, we need to cut spending, and we need to, you know, we all oh, that pension problem is going to be bad. We need to address it. And yeah, the PFD is an issue that that, that we're going to have to deal with. Not not a candidate who can list the issues, but a candidate who has a firm mind about how they're going to deal with the issues. Right. And to me, there are there are really three issues. That, that to me, candidates need to be talking about and need to come to grips with. One is, what's your size of the budget? T- tell me, tell me your size of the budget, uh, overall budget. Don't tell. I don't. I, you know, I honestly really don't care at this point about where you're going to cut. Tell me what your total budget number is, uh, and that's and, and and I'll have a sense of whether or not you're one of the ones who really has thought through this issue. And has thought and thought through to you know a number that that we can live with, or if you're one of the ones who's who's still out there talking about you know continuing the status quo. Oh, we've got it down to 4.2, 4.5. Aren't we good? Now we just have to keep it there uh, and maintain it going forward. If you tell me that, if you say 4.2, 4.5, around where we are now is good enough, I'm gonna my my the thought that's gonna go through my head is okay you're going to have to raise revenues and you're either going to cut the PFD more or you're going to implement some sort of tax because 4.2, 4.5 isn't good enough on the revenue base we've got. Right. So I'm, I'm looking for a candidate who's thought through this enough and said, my number is about 3.75. Then I'll ask you where you're going to make the cuts, but I don't, don't, I don't care where you're going to make the cuts. Um, if, if, if you've got the right number, you'll find a way, to make the cuts to get down to the right number. If you don't have the right number in mind as a starting point, I really, I, you're going to end up being part of the problem, not part of the solution. Second issue is, do you care? Are, are you in favor of kicking costs down the road or not? Do you have a history of kicking costs down the road, uh, or are are you on board with this generation confronting the fiscal situation that we've created, confronting it now, and not making it worse for future generations? One test of that is HB 331. Did you vote uh, for H- HB 331 to kick costs down, essentially to kick costs down to the road, in, down the road, all tax credits down the road into the 2020s and 2030s? If you did that, then you're going to be prone to kick other costs down the road when those issues come up. And believe me, people are going to be trying to fi- fi- figure out other ways to kick costs down the road. So tell me where you stand and show me where you stand on kicking costs down the road. HB 331 is a perfect test for that. Um, and if you if you voted to kick those costs down the road, then frankly, I don't think you're serious about this issue or you haven't thought through the issue, which is probably uh, probably just as bad. And then the third thing I'm looking for from a candidate is the PFD. Do you do you believe in in maintaining the PFD at the at the historic level that the governor Hammond talked about 50 percent? Uh, of earnings or 50% of the draw or 50% of whatever it is we, we generate as the revenue stream, do you believe in maintaining that 50-50 relationship or are you looking to pull money out of the private sector and push it over to the government sector? If you're that, if you believe in cutting the PFD down from 50%, then essentially you're arguing in favor of taxes. And worse of all, you're arguing in favor of taxes that have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and are by far the costliest to Alaska families. So you, you're a taxer, uh, and, you're, and you're someone who doesn't care about the economic consequence of the tax uh, on, on the overall economy. And you know, frankly, I have little use for people who, who think that way, because they're just going to keep getting us into trouble. Right. These, are the, these, are the people, these are the people who have got us into trouble in, in the past. There's no reason to believe they're not going to continue to get us into trouble in the future. So tell me what your budget number is. Uh, tell me where you stand on kicking costs down the road and tell me, tell me what your stand is uh, on the PFD. Those, those three tests uh, are the tests that I think really will help um, uh, me identify the candidates that, that I think have the, have the 
best chance to get this state through its current fiscal situation and out in the best shape we can into the 2020s. Uh, people who can't answer those questions or give the wrong answer to those questions, frankly, I think they need to go. Whether they're incumbents, whether they're Republicans, whether they're, you know, whatever they are, if they can't get those three questions right, I think they need to go. Well, and I think and I think that that really is the bigger issue here of, uh, you know, of do we send the same people back over and over and over again and expect different results? I think we could all agree that that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever, because obviously if they couldn't see the forest for the trees now or before, what's going to what's going to change that for now? And which is why we've been calling for a changing of the players. And you actually have kind of a legit scorecard here where you're you're starting to take each one of these candidates in turn and taking a look at it. I'm posting it uh, in the uh, in the chat right now so people can actually see the uh, the actual picture. But it it literally shows you who's running for what, who's the incumbent, and we're going to have to start scoring this stuff ourselves and deciding who is going to be the best choice. And quite honestly, at this point, I don't care if you're an R, a D, an I, an L. I really don't care. I want to know what your answer are to the questions that Brad just asked. And if they're if they're in line with that, then I think you probably have my vote at this point. Yeah, it's I. I th- this is you're never going to get candidates in a better position than you have them. You're never going to get politicians in a better position than you have them now. They want your vote. And, and, and you should want as a voter, you should want precision out of these candidates, not, not I'm going to, you know, save the PFD. I'm for saving the PFD. Well, the Senate would tell you they were saving the PFD. They were just going to save it at at 25%. The governor would tell you that he's going to save the PFD. He's just going to save it at 33%. I mean, tell me what your PFD percentage is. Don't tell me you're going to save the PFD. I mean, a dollar. You can say you're saving it at a dollar. Right. Tell me what your PFD percentage is. Tell me if you're cutting in to the portion that Governor Hammond envisioned for the private sector. Tell me if you're cutting in to the, the in a way that has the largest ha- adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and is by far the costliest to Alaska families. Tell me if you're cutting below 50%. If you are, then tell me that. If you if you can't tell me that, if you can't tell me what your percentage is, then you're part of the problem because right. you're just malleable and you'll go along with. I mean, it's sort of like it's sort of like Mia Costello in West Anchorage, right? Oh, she's for saving the PFD. Well, she voted with the Senate to cut it to to 25 percent, down from 50 percent, down to 25 percent. Vote to cut the PFD in half. That's not saving the PFD in the sense that Governor Hammond envisioned the PFD. It's saving something else, but it's not saving the PFD. So right. give me a percentage. If you can't give me a percentage, you're part of the problem. Yep, I would agree with that. Brad, if folks want to find out more about this, what do they do? So the, the best place to go is to go to the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. Everything we post sort of filters through that. Uh, it's not the perfect place because it's hard to go back and get back uh, 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 previous material. You can find that on bgkeithley.com. But but the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page uh, is the way to keep up with, uh, with with what's going on currently, with our comments currently, and with issues that we believe are important currently. I posted uh, Brad's latest article on the uh, mission statement and this list. You can take a look at the list of incumbents and see who's in your area and ready to go, who has a challenger, and then you can go out there and ask these three questions, which I think are important. One, what is your budget number and where are you cutting? Two, what is your thoughts? What was your vote on 331? And three, what is your thought on the full payout of the PFD and the 50-50 split? Where do you fall on that? I think those are three critical questions that need to be asked. And this is all of the finite. We're putting the whole crime thing aside. Those are the three things on the fiscal health of the state moving forward. It's important stuff. And uh, and I'm glad you're able to come out here. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and talking with us today. As always, we love having you on the program. Michael, and as always, thank you for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. and Keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.